All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our Ansible study group. It's actually one that I'm really excited about because it gets to combine two of my passions. And that's because I come from an open source and OpenStack background and Ansible is really big in the OpenStack world. But I have to admit that I was one of those people that was just running the playbooks without really understanding what it was that Ansible was doing and how they were configured. So I thought this would be a great opportunity for us to come together and to learn a little bit about the basics and the background behind Ansible. And Wes, you were kind enough to volunteer to help me get this set up. And I have to ask, you know, the question that I always ask people when they help with these study groups is, Wes, how did you get your start in tech and how did you get your start with Ansible? No, that's a great question, Al. Um, well, academically, I was always interested in computer science, but I actually got a degree in physics. So I started using Linux because, well, all the models we were building would run on servers running Linux. So I started using Linux and really before I was doing anything serious with, you know, DevOps or anything in, in production on Linux servers besides just research stuff, I became a Linux desktop user. And, you know, for, for anyone out there who is a Linux desktop user, before long, you'll probably run into a problem you'll probably run into the problem of too many configuration files. I know I know, I certainly did between dot .files and files under slash etc that you, you want to keep maybe the same or at least pretty close to the same between systems. Now, at the time, I was using um, a system called GNU Sto, but it's not, it, it doesn't, it's not trying to be, but it's not nearly as powerful as things like Ansible, and it was basically just a, a system to manage symlinks. So I could have one folder with a tree that sort of mirrored the, you know, the directory structure I'd like on my disk, keep that in Git, track it, or, you know, copy it between systems, and then Stowe would set up symlinks back to the places they needed to be. But, you know, obviously that wasn't great. And these days there's a whole bunch of different open source tools that you can find to manage dot .files in particular. But Ansible, being a more general tool, immediately popped up. Um, so I started playing with it for that and, you know, sort of learned how it worked, didn't do anything serious. And then years later, once I was working, um, do, you know, providing developer tooling, working on DevOps problems, I ran into a system that was using Ansible to configure pretty much the entirety of the virtual machine infrastructure used by the company. Wow, that actually seems, it's funny because you tell the story and I'm like, oh, you know, Ansible could seem like a light at the end of the tunnel. Hey, it's going to make work simpler. But being new to Ansible and trying to figure it out, it also seems like we're just adding another part to the equation, something else to learn. You know, once you started using it, what did you find kind of the end result to be for you? You know, one thing I like about Ansible, and, and really all the tools are, are useful. Ansible is just one that happened, you know, we're talking about today, and there's a lot of great content and documentation around. But really, it, it's it's just simple. I was already someone who likes using Python, and Ansible is definitely Python-based. It's written in Python. You can use it from Python. And if you want to extend it with your own modules, well, you can write them in Python. So that, that appealed to me already because Python is a very simple and direct language. And then in particular... Ansible is very declarative. You don't you don't tell the computer what to do. You just tell it what you want your end goal. You know, I need the system to have this system or this package. I don't care what you do to get there. Ansible will just make sure that that's the final state. So I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here because, you know, I kind of started this off with the assumption that everyone joining us would already know what Ansible is. But that's a horrible assumption to make. Everyone is a different place in their journey. Absolutely. So how would yeah. How would you sum up what Ansible is to someone who perhaps hasn't heard of configuration management? Or Yeah, you know, and that can be particularly difficult because a lot of these tools, and, and definitely Ansible is in that category, they can do so many things. You know, they're complicated, powerful software that can do a lot. So it can be hard to really distinctly summarize them. But, but I think that at the core, and, and you talked about a little bit there, so configuration management, really, I like to think of it as trying to manage all of the state that you can on a particular machine. So, so basically, you you know you have your computer, and in the in the old days, you were you were trying to make a new computer, and a lot of these tools spawn you know spawned out of big deployments of a lot of servers in data centers, and you run into the problem pretty quickly that oh my, when we do this hand by hand, people make mistakes, people forget things, and really you end up with you know maybe if if you're lucky, it's a wiki page 
or a checklist or some sort of list of all the installed packages and hopefully their configurations are documented and, and ideally kept in Git somewhere or version control. Ansible can help you solve all those problems. And, and really, it just lets you at a high level tell the computer what you want it to do. You know, I, I need you to run an SSH server. I want you to have this package installed because I like to use it. And then you say, Ansible, execute, execute this stuff. Make my system into the configuration I desire. And it handles all the stuff to go first, check the system and find out what state it's in now, and then figure out all the little moves it needs to make to bring the system from that state to whatever state you want it to be in. But once you've started using tooling, instead of doing this stuff by hand, I think one of the bigger things is you just have a mental shift, right? Instead of going out to a, a server and, and trying to make ad hoc changes, you start you start going through a process and usually you've got some testing infrastructure or something set up so you can start playing with this in reproducible ways. Um, I, I do, you know, I, I've had a lot of positive experiences with Chef and with Salt and, and with Puppet too. A lot of these systems have tons of value, but Ansible, I think, is very high level. I really like the declarative approach and, and it's easy to integrate into other systems because you can use it as a Python library. You can also just use it as an agent to drive just shell commands on other systems. So it's incredibly flexible. And so between those two, you can almost always make it do what you need it to do. Kind of going on what you just said here is, so we do have a demo, so guys stay tuned for that. But before we get there, we've kind of been singing its praises, but there are some disadvantages or perhaps some hurdles that we should be aware of before just jumping into Ansible and config management as a whole. What's been some of your experiences and things you wish you would have known before you just, you know, ran the script? Well, you do have to kind of be invested. Not not invested, that's too strong of a word, but... You know, you are going to be using some Python, and it might be a little bit, um, we, we've linked to some install documentation, but there can be a few hurdles depending on your system. There's a PPA for Ubuntu or um, an easy repository you can add over in Fedora land. So be prepared to do just a tiny little bit of setup to get involved. The other thing to note is, you know, you can use some things like like Ansible Tower, for instance, which we're not really going to touch on today because that's it's kind of beyond the scope. But there's lots of great documentation that you can find, and we'll have links to that too. Most of the time, people end up using Ansible in what's known as an agentless manner, right? So you, Ansible can just do things locally, or it can use SSH, and it has very powerful SSH capabilities. That can be great, but in certain circumstances, under a certain scale, or if you have a huge number of machines you're working with, you can definitely run into some problems where it's just a lot of SSH connections, and there's a little bit of latency. If you compare that with something like Chef, for instance, and again, these are generalizations. All of these things, you know, there's optimizations, there's changes, you can run them in different ways. But by default, or at least the most common ways that you see these things, when you when you do a chef run, the chef server has all this information, you go and get the new state from the system, send it up to the chef server, and then it computes all the changes. So instead of having to do all that stuff over multiple SSH connections, it just does it as once, sends it back to the machine, and then the machine renders all the changes out. So under certain things, you might run into needing to set up multiple Ansible servers or doing some optimizations just because applying changes to thousands of machines could be kind of slow, especially if they're, you know, halfway around the world. I actually really love the way that you explain that. And I see that for those that are involved in the IRC room, we're getting some good discussion on what's going on on the back end. And you know, I think you really have people's minds going right now. And you've been kind enough to come up with a demo to really show us what's going to happen in action. Can you tell us a little bit about the demo before you kick it off? I can't. Before we do that, though, I was just curious because you mentioned using the playbooks. And, uh, you know, we didn't talk about this. So I'm putting you on the spot, Al. What's your experience been with Ansible? You know, I hate to say it, but I really was a monkey with a keyboard when it came to Ansible. You know, we did Ansible deployments for OpenStack, and it was very much just run the playbook. And I enjoyed it because when it was done, you had, or if it didn't finish, if it aired out, you had very clear and concise information on what went wrong. You could go back and fix that one specific area and run the playbook again, and the script and everything would pick up where it left off instead of having to go through the whole whole build all over again, which when you're doing full OpenStack deployments can save you days at a time. That makes a lot of sense. And I can see why. I mean, sometimes you just have very complicated playbooks and um, you just you just need to run them because someone else already figured it all out. 
So now that I have uh, kind of admitted to being a monkey with a keyboard for a while, but yeah, that, I think that's how we all learn. And at times, just running something and getting to use the technology really is what you need to get your hands dirty and get to learning it. So that's kind of why I'm excited about the demo, because a lot of times people say, you know what, I want to learn Ansible. And so they get it configured and it's, okay, now what? Like, how do I learn it? What do I start with? So I'm hoping that this will give a lot of our study group an idea of what they can go out and learn it with. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of the aim. You know, this isn't an advanced study group. This is just sort of a demo to show you that you don't have to know a whole bunch. You don't have to be anything more than interested in deploying the technology and it can be really accessible to you. So I I love that you said that. And you did already mention playbooks. We can talk a little bit about you know, just what Ansible is made up of. And and playbooks are the the high level, and playbook is a great term because it's basically what you want to accomplish. And primarily a playbook is going to be made up of tasks. And a task is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's a it's a single task that you want to do. And that could be, you know, just, just trying to gather information um, or installing a package on a system. The other primary concept you're going to run into almost immediately is inventory. And just at the high level inventory is about what it sounds like too it's it's almost always a list of the hosts that you're going to use and you know that's never going to be one list at least it's really simple so ansible has a, a rich set of tools to let you divide that up so you can say like oh you know these are all the hosts that belong to this data center or this certain class of machine that runs this type of software all of that is you know probably beyond what we need to get started with because th- the thing about this software is you're going to have to dig in right It's only a useful tool if you have actual problems that you want to solve. And so the easiest way to get started is to just go install it. So yeah, as we said, there's a PPA and I've already got it installed here on on an 1804 system. It's easy to install basically anywhere Python runs because it's written in Python. So as the IRC room has so wisely pointed out, it's really just a pip install away. Okay, so uh, up on the stream, I've just got um, a YAML file. Let's, Let's take a quick look. And, and someone else in the IRC pointed out, one of the nice things about Ansible is that primarily you're going to talk to it through YAML. And we've already had a YAML study group. If you weren't lucky enough to attend that, Linux Academy's got some great YAML resources, and there's tons of other documentation out there. And the nice part about YAML is it's it's usually pretty simple and accessible to people. And so instead of having to learn to write a programming language, you just have to learn this simple language to describe the data that you want to tell the computer about. So up on the screen, you'll see just a list here. And and one of the things I like about Ansible is you can totally get started with just using it for your local system. And that's what I first did. I just wanted to manage this, you know, the desktops, the laptops that I had at my house. So here we've got a we've got a host section listing the hosts that we want to talk to. And we're just going to include localhost. That little bit you see underneath that says connection, um, well, that's because primarily SSH gets used, I mean Primarily, Ansible uses SSH to connect to other hosts. Here, though, that's not really necessary. We're just running it locally. So connection local is a little optimization that'll make it faster. Now, I don't know about you, but I frequently mistype the ls command, right? And uh, that usually comes out as sl. Thankfully, people have thought about that. And there's a handy little tool called Steam Locomotive, which uh, just gives you a little bit of pain to try to teach you to type better. I like to install that on on some machines that I have, and I thought a good example could be getting Ansible to do that for us. So here in our little playbook, our demo playbook, we've got our first task. You can give it a nice little descriptive name, and that's going to just be install SL. And then since we're on a Debian-based system and we're using the apt package manager, we're going to use apt right there, and then just tell it the name of the package that we want to install. Now here's for the demo part. There's, there's several different interfaces to Ansible. Um, right now, because we're just going to do a local demo, we're going to use the Ansible playbook command, which is the command that you use to run a one-off playbook. All right, here we go. Now, there's going to be a little warning right there, but it, it's still doing what we want. And you'll see, first, it's going to gather up the tasks. Oh, okay. And we run into our first problem. You'll see here it's, it's using the play and it's going to run against the local host. It's giving us a little warning that it's using local host and that we should know that you have to actually say 
that you want to include localhost, we already took care of that with all the stuff at the top, so that's fine. Next up, it's going to start executing our tasks. And the first one we had was to install SL. And here you'll see it's failed. And it, it's nice enough to show you in bright red that there's been a problem, right? We can see that, it, that nothing has changed and that the message is, well, no package containing... Uh, uh, oh, see, and that's the problem we have already. And, and this is going to be something you're going to run into all the time and you should really be prepared for is failure. It's easy to get things wrong. And the only way to learn is to just keep banging your head against it. Maybe read a little bit more documentation and continue. So let's go fix that. Of course, I just have a, a, a little typo here, so we can we can resolve that, and then try our command again. All right. And now we'll see if we mistype SL. Well, we get a steam locomotive, which I don't know about you, but I just love. Now, okay, that's that's um, a little bit trivial, but it, it just shows you that it's really easy. I mean, look at this look at this file, right? There's not a lot going on, and it's easy to get started. So if you want to like the next thing that I almost always end up doing on a system, well, that that's going to be install SSH, right? There we go. All right, so here's a little bit more complicated. And just to show you kind of how, to, how, do you, how this gets a little bit more generic as you go on. And the first part is, is all going to be the same, right? And I've just kept installing SL there as an example. Because the thing about Ansible, you're not telling it an imperative list of instructions, right? You're telling it, this is the way I want the system to look. So you don't have to go try to keep track of what state the system is in yourself. The whole point is Ansible does that for you. Your only job is to describe the system the way that you want it to be. Does that make sense? I think you're making great sense right now. <laughs> Perfect. And that's, um, as I mentioned before, that's one thing to look out for. It can be incredibly useful. Uh, Ansible makes it really easy to just run a one-off command, and that can be super helpful. But you should understand, in that case, all the responsibilities of keeping track of state are then yours when you're using a nice module right so instead of running apt here i could just ask it to run the shell command for me you know like apt get install package name and that would work fine for apt because if you try to install a package that's already installed it's not going to break anything but for more complicated systems that might actually cause a big problem and when you use the built-in modules like for instance the apt module or the service module which we'll see this which we'll see in a second the, the back end code in that module is doing all the complicated state management tracking for you. So that's how it can go figure out, look at the state of the system, compare what you want to do with the current state, and actually figure out what to do safely. So in our second example here, we're just going to add SSH. So we added a little descriptive name, install SSH. We'll run apt install open SSH server. And then as an, another example of what you can do, we'll also make sure that the service is enabled. Now, on Debian, that's probably already going to be the case, but that's not true on all systems. And the whole point is, is I don't care what the defaults are. I know I want it to be started and enabled. Ansible, help me out here. Now we'll see what it looks like to run it. Okay, and there we go. And and so that, that's all it takes to get started. Now, you can see here if we um if we disable something, or we can see that SSH is is started and enabled. And we can kind of see what happens if it's not. So if I go and start it, gotta use sudo, of course. So now we see nope, no longer running. There's no there's no gonna not gonna be any SSH running, and we can run Ansible just the same. And here, we run into a problem. And that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. You are going to have to make sure that you have pseudo credentials figured out. And as always, it's usually not advised to go use root everywhere you are, right? You shouldn't go be SSHing to servers as root. So unfortunately, it's usually on you 
to go get all of that managed and provide hopefully something using key or certificate-based authentication that Ansible can use. And then once you're there, well, there's a handy little flag. It used to be called sudo. These days it's called become for become user. The default user is sudo. And now you'll see if we run it. Perfect. And here you can see that finally we've had our first real change because before the service was already running. But we stopped it explicitly. And Ansible gives you a handy little recap here so that you can see like what actually happened. Now, we're not going to have anything in unreachable and hopefully nothing had failed this run. But we did have one thing changed. You can also get a few more details out of Ansible, which can be super helpful when you're just getting started and you're trying to debug. And that's by passing the V flag. So you'll see already there's a whole bunch more stuff spewed out. And, uh, oh my, that's a lot. So you'll see here it's giving us basically a whole bunch of information that it has. This is all about the service that it happened to run here for the enable SSH task. And that that's, that's basically it. That's all you need to get started. Go install Ansible. Get yourself a little setup. And, and the nice thing here, like if you look again at our file... That's it. That, that's all you need to get started. And, and the process I recommend, let's say, I, I think a good first project, actually. I mean, if you want, go get like a, you know, go get a, a server somewhere on whatever cloud provider you like. Start playing with that. But if you have a Linux VM, you know, on any system that you have, get Ansible installed and then try setting up a desktop. Because I don't know about you, anytime I'm, and I actually, you know, I do know about you, El, and I know you re-kick all the time. You can't be kept on one desktop, right? But you probably also have to get work done. And that means you have certain packages and configuration that you need. So you can take something as simple as this file, start tweaking it, go make a list of all the packages that you normally go through and add, and start learning Ansible. And pretty quick, you're going to run into a, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more complicated situation than we talked about today. And that's where we have a few more resources available. So before you go on, Wes, there is a kind of, I guess, good discussion going on that I wanted to bring you in on, and that is running Ansible through multiple servers when the OSs aren't the same. You know, what is some advice that you'd give to that? Because there's been conversation about how does the system know when to use apt or you know, other package managers through the script that you're writing? That, that's, that is a good question. And it, it sort of depends on the module. Some, um, like service, for instance, are smart enough to use either cross-platform or have their own translation layer in between. And in other cases, you do have to do things a little bit explicitly. Um, so here you're seeing we're used, using apt. Um, you'll, you'll also often, though, run into, there's enough little differences, for instance, like between package names, that probably that's where well, you'll take advantage of some of the, the capabilities it has for grouping your inventory. So you'll, you'll probably have a set of, let's say, rel hosts and then a set of Debian hosts. And you'll probably have a few different um, task configured depending on which which you know which group the particular host is in and make sure guys if you have questions to go ahead and get them in the IRC room we are monitoring and trying to you know keep everyone caught up sorry to interrupt you but I thought that might be good to go into before we continued no that, that that's great and um, you know we've got a good mumble room we could we could probably bring them in, in too it looks like there's there's all kinds of great contributions waiting there uh, Al, what's a good place that people can go? I mean, we're going to have a whole bunch of uh, links provided up up on our GitHub group. But in particular, uh, you just uh, announced some pretty pretty neat free Ansible stuff over at Linux Academy, right? Yep, we've actually set the Ansible Quick Start book, or book, yes, <laughs> the Ansible Quick Start course for free. So if you go in and you become a Linux Academy community member, and I mean, we're not looking to grab your money, this is completely free, you'll have access to go through the training, figure out how to actually set up your you know, Ansible service, how to do it with multiple nodes, how to set up SSH ID so that you can have that configuration management without having to worry about sudo or you know, entering the password every time. It actually even goes into some secure environments where you are going to want to have the password in and how to manage that as well. So it was actually a really interesting course for me to take. Oh, yeah, that's great. You know, honestly, it's good anytime that you're coming back because, as you said, you're probably going to end up using multiple types of configuration management tooling. A lot of the concepts are, are going to translate, but some of the particulars don't. So that's where it's especially useful to have something like that is a, a nice quick reference you can just go back to 
and become re- reacquainted with all the little details. You really need to get, you know, in the nitty gritty with the stuff, get a, re- a repo going, get Ansible installed and start playing with it. Um, there's a couple links in particular that we've got where what I love about GitHub, right, and the open source community is there's multiple docu- documenting cases and, and some from our community of people who have all of their desktop configuration posted as well as, you know, server roles, all kinds of more complicated stuff. So you can go check those out. We'll have links, clone those down, and just get started playing in a VM or in a container. Um, I've been using, actually, I love the name of this one, Cosmic Narwhal, and it's just an LXD container I threw up specifically for the demo. So easy peasy. You don't have to worry about messing up your system. Just get started with configuration management. Now, we do have a question in the RSU room, and it's open to you, or I guess anyone else in our Mumble room, too. You know, this is a study group. You're more than welcome to come and talk. And it's about host inventories. And it says, I like using the file system tree structure, um, but would, but when should I use database instead? That one's actually over my head. I'm not sure. Wes, I don't know if you can. Mm, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Probably when you need more, if you're going to involve a d- database and, and something that can have either higher performance needs um, or m- maybe more dynamic updates. Advantages of having the file system layout is it's exactly like it sounds, right? Where you just have a list of, you know, you can have folders and a natural sort of dist- directory structure that mirrors maybe how you want to separate things. Um, if you have a more complicated database setup, really the, the, the cost is the overhead. I probably wouldn't make that move unless you're seeing a lot of limitations with the default setup that would actually be solved by moving to database. And there you're just going to have to read a bunch of, you know, documentation and uh, user reports. Yeah, f- file systems usually fine, at least for the things I want. And it also depends on how you're going, how, you know, how you scale, because you might end up with, you know, depending on if you're using Tower or you've got multiple control servers, maybe there's, unfortunately, once you're at, you know, a particularly large scale, there's just so many different ways you can configure it, which is good. It also means there's not always a generic answer. We do have some and people pointing like- out the, um, the Ansible docs, docs.ansible.com. And you know what? That's a that's a fantastic resource. There's just all kinds of stuff there. They've got it on all the latest versions. It's easy to read. It's using the, the read the docs format. So it, it's just, it's really impressive. Um, like I said, I've used a lot of Chef. Chef has some great documentations. I like Chef. The Ansible docs are way better. So we can't seem to get away from the concept of containers, and I, I blame you for bringing it up. But we did have a few questions that have kind of gone by in the IRC room about the relationship between Ansible and containers. Is it using Ansible to spin up containers, or is it using containers to run your Ansible environments? What's been your experience? I mean, it's kind of all of the all of the above. Um, you you can certainly use Ansible for some dynamic things, like like managing what containers are running. I'm not sure it's necessarily the best tool, but what the best tool is depends on your familiarity. Another thing you can do is use Ansible to provision containers, right? So you're probably if you're if you've used containers, you're probably familiar with Docker and, and the Docker file. Well, another way to do that, maybe using systems like um, like Packer, for instance, is you know basically a container ends up just needing a file system, and you can have Ansible build that. So if you have some in particular, let's say you have some like VM infrastructure that you're using Ansible or a configuration management system already, and you have some containers, you could reuse the tasks and playbooks you've written to configure the containers. I did want to give time for uh, to talk about where we're going to go forward with the study group. So you guys have seen a little bit of a change with Wes leading the study group this time. Um, and I actually put it up on Twitter and said, what do you guys want to learn? And I gave everyone the opportunity to vote and security won. So for you, right, I'm so excited. Security is definitely something that I'm interested in. And for this next three three months, the next quarter, we're going to be trying to focus all of that, um, basically all of our study groups on security-based concepts. I'd love to get some idea on what you guys are wanting to learn. I thought a little bit about going into, hey, what does it mean to red team? What does it mean to blue team? What are basic security concepts that we can learn to start looking for employment or strengthen our skills for our current employment? So I would love some feedback um, from people on that. 
And the other thing is that we are going to be leaving, unfortunately, IRC and Mumble Rooms, and we're going to be moving over to YouTube. So when you see that meetup invite go out, make sure that you go through and read the instructions so that you know how to be a part of the conversation. Um, Wes, can you think of anything that I'm forgetting? No, you know, it's just something we've been we've been playing with. And yeah, that that's the easiest way to make sure you're not going to miss the next one because... I'm I'm really excited about the security stuff. I think you've done a great job of lining up some stuff that, you know, we haven't, it's been a while since we've really covered on JB in general, and you found some great resources. So even if, you know, you haven't liked some of the other ones or you you think you already know, I think it's just going to be a fun thing to hang around. And one of the great parts is, you know, we're still going to have a chat system in place. We love it when people come and share their knowledge because, you know, we can only share so much stuff, the community is always the real strength. And I think that this is what I've loved the most out of this study group session is how active that IRC room was. You know, we had people asking questions and it being answered by two or three other people before I could even get to it. So I, I love seeing the community come together and I hope that this next study group and keeping the same concepts, you know, security for three months is really going to help provide a foundation for people who are starting out and give an opportunity for those of you that are already part of the security community to come and give back and, you know, kind of be those mentors for us. Go have fun learning some more Ansible. Play with it at home. <laughs>